the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday afternoon from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over the airwaves of Sirius XM, Mad Dog Sports Radio. The number to call up, as always, is 888-MAD-DOG-6. That's 888-623-3646. Hope you all had an absolutely wonderful weekend. I know I did for the most part. Thoroughly enjoyed myself, joined my weekend of sports. And then it got interrupted by the National Football League. Yes, I'm pointing the finger at the National Football League. There was a Hall of Fame game that was supposed to take place this weekend. There was a Hall of Fame game that was supposed to take place. But it wasn't meant to be. And the reason why it wasn't meant to be, ladies and gentlemen, the National Football League will have you believe is that, you know what? Something happened. Paint was congealed. On a football field, midfield, the end zone. For those of you who don't know the meaning of the word congealed, it means hardened. So in other words, you stepped on grass and it almost felt like cement. And obviously that was deemed a very precarious situation and circumstance under which the NFL players would have had to play. Needless to say, it was not worth the risk. Needless to say, the game was ultimately canceled. And needless to say that somebody in all likelihood, as my newest colleague, Randy Moss of NFL, of our NFL coverage and NFL countdown, he'll be on this year. So he so eloquently put it yesterday. Somebody needs to be fired. These kind of mistakes simply can't be made. Administratively, laboriously, you can't make these state, you can't make these mistakes. Everybody knows that the Hall of Fame game It's going to be in Canton, Ohio, every single year. You have plenty of time to plan this. There's nothing sudden about this. There's nothing that creeped up or snuck up on you as it pertains to this. The fact that this game ultimately was one that did not take place. It's just a catastrophe. Now, I don't use that word in its literal sense because we all know the true meaning of a catastrophe usually involves lives, and no lives were lost here. So we're putting it in in sports vernacular. Please take it in the spirit in which I'm giving it. I'm not talking about a literal catastrophe, but from a sports perspective, does it get any worse? People traveling from all over the place to come see a game that you've advertised and marketed? Paying hotels? For their hotel rooms, gas, airline tickets, etc. Hall of Famers expected to be honored in front of a sellout crowd. And obviously a game that was scheduled to take place. And it doesn't happen. How do you think this is? I mean, this is an absolute colossal embarrassment. And the reason why I put it at the doorsteps of the NFL is because doesn't the buck stop with them? I understand they're not running it. I understand that the NFL, led by President, you know, uh, the Hall of Fame, rather, led by President David Baker, operates separately and relatively independently of the National Football League. But I'm sorry, I thought it was two National Football League teams playing here. Don't tell me the NFL had nothing to do with this. Don't tell me the NFL is completely innocent in all of this, that they should be completely absolved from blame. That's utterly ridiculous. That's utterly ridiculous. You are a multi-billion dollar establishment. You got owners pocketing $226 million checks for one season of revenue. That's what you have. And yet, and still, this same organization who turned around and tried to charge individuals to perform at the Super Bowl, whether it was Beyonce, Coldplay, or Bruno Mars. You tried to charge people to perform at your Super Bowl. That's what you tried to do. And as meticulous as you are about getting your money, you couldn't exercise that level of appropriate and due diligence to make sure that you didn't have your ducks in a row and everything in order to actually have a game played. You dropped the ball. And I don't know where this lands on the list of embarrassing 
or egregious scenarios on the part of Roger Goodell, but this is up there. Guy by the name of Kevin Seifert, NFL Nation, wrote an article posted on ESPN.com. It reads, as is so often with the NFL, you don't know whether to laugh, shake your head, or wag your finger at Sunday night's decision to cancel the Hall of Fame game. So let's do all three. He says it's funny, of course, because it's only August 7th. And already the league has provided fresh grist to a sporting public that craves moments to rake its credibility. It's ridiculous, naturally, to think that an NFL event, preseason or otherwise, was scuttled by something as dumb as congealed field paint. And it's genuinely concerning, unfortunately, that the league still has enough holes in its recently strengthened stadium protocol for this to happen. According to officials from both teams, no one discovered the field's poor conditions until two hours before the scheduled kickoff. Pro Football Hall of Fame President David Baker said, quote, it was an easy ethical decision to cancel the game. And a joint statement from the NFL and the NFL Players Association touted that, quote, player safety is our primary concern. You see how they're couching this? It's all about player safety, huh? All about player safety. We did this for them. We're thinking about them. We love them. We crave them. We want to protect them. Then why the hell didn't you make sure the field was okay? And why didn't you check on it before two hours before game time? And if something could get congealed, if field paint can get congealed, which again means hardened, if that could happen, then how come you don't have some anti-congealed, anti-hardened substance to soften the damn field so the players can play on it? Is that so hard? Is that so hard? And oh, by the way, for those of you who act like this is not a big deal, for those of you who want to act like so what this has happened, it's just an exhibition game. You want me to tell you who deserves the biggest apology? Other than those fans who travel to the game. How about ESPN? My employer. One of my employers. Let's just call it what it is. You can say whatever you want to say. Let me ask y'all a question. Who did you think was going to receive better ratings last night? The Olympics? Or the NFL preseason Hall of Fame game. Who did you think was going to pull that off last night? Who? Did you know that in 2015, ESPN had a rating of 6.9? Did you know that? Did you know that ESPN had a rating of 6.9? It's according to my producer extraordinaire, Jonathan Winthrop, who's never wrong in, in his preparation for me during the show. Now, he's wrong with opinions he gives based off the facts. He's wrong all the time about that. His perspective is warped. I think the brother's sick half the time, personally. Thank God Nuno Texiera, my other producer extraordinaire, is there to keep him in check. That much is true. But the information he provides leading up to his perspective is never wrong. ESPN, last year, in 2015, had an overnight rating of 6.9. Many playoff games and all other sports don't draw a rating that big. Jonathan's right about that. Stanley Cup Finals, NBA Eastern and Western Conference Finals, the AL and NLCS all had games with smaller ratings than the NFL's Hall of Fame game, which is 6.9% on a 6.9 rating. I mean, you can't make this up, y'all. You just can't make this up. So I say all of that to you to say this. It's a damn travesty this took place. And this is on the doorsteps of Roger Goodell. You are the commissioner of the league. You run the show. Perhaps if you weren't so damn preoccupied with the flake gate and all that came with it, you'd have found the time to make sure everybody was on their A game so nobody slipped up here. And unlike most Roger Goodell critics, I'm not one of them. I actually like him. And I think by and large, despite his mistakes, he does a relatively good job. But this 
Whoa, this is bad. This is bad. Triple A Mad Dog Six is the number to call up. That's 888-623-3646. Not bad, however, not as bad, however, as Alex Rodriguez. Ladies and gentlemen, I watched this press conference yesterday. This this New York Yankee who, who who basically had a press conference to announce that he will no longer be playing baseball for the New York Yankees. He didn't retire, mind you. He didn't retire. But he confessed that this Friday will be his last game, at which time, so while still in the process of collecting all of his 27 plus million he's owed for the final month of this season, final month and a half of this season, and of course, all of next season, Alex Rodriguez is going to serve the rest of his time as a special advisor to the New York Yankees. First of all, talk about a crock. The Yankees don't give a damn what A-Rod is doing. They don't give a damn they never see A-Rod again. He's batting 204. He's only got nine home runs. He hasn't been the individual they need him to be. Don't get me started. Yankees don't give a damn what A-Rod is doing. They could care less. They could give two cents about what A-Rod is doing once he departs ways from the New York Yankees as a player next Friday. But enough of that, because that's not really the issue with me. You know what the issue is with me? Alex Rodriguez himself. You talk about somebody coming across as fake and as phony and as fraudulent as you can be. Did you see that press conference yesterday? First of all, he wasn't wearing a Yankee jersey. Secondly, did you see how he started crying? But first he made to rub, make sure to rub his eyes. Then took off his baseball cap. Then looked into the camera. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I was given a recurring role on General Hospital. My character's name is Brick. I'm no actor, but they tell me I do a good job. And they love having me on, and I love them for having me on. I'm honored because I've been watching the soap operas General Hospital for the last 40 years. I got to tell you, I think Victor Newman... The guy that plays Victor Newman on Young and the Restless, Eric Braden, who's a personal friend of mine, I think he's phenomenal. I think Maurice Bernard, who plays Sonny Corinthos on General Hospital, my favorite soap opera, is phenomenal. And I can sit here right now and tell you, I think A-Rod would give them both a run for their money, considering that acting performance he put on yesterday. I mean, you got to be kidding me. Uh, you got to be kidding me. I mean, really? Seriously? I mean, talk about that. That's the phony. T uh, listen, this is what makes it hard. I'm almost scared to say I actually agree with my producer, Jonathan, with up to some degree when he talks about how A-Rod should be a Hall of Famer. 696 career home runs, fourth all time, just four removed from 700. Number one in history in, gr in grand slams with 25. All right. Top three in hits, top two in RBIs. I mean, a man is phenomenal in terms of numbers. But then you remember, you are rather you strove to forget as in strive. You strove to forget how he was on a list of 103 players because you said, you know what? There was 103 players on that list. The Mitchell report that came down in 2009 about what dudes were doing in 2003, that Mitchell report revealed that Alex Rodriguez's name was on that list. But you know what? I said, hey, there's 100 other names on that list. None of them hit 600 home runs. So I tried to let that go. But then not only did he cheat once, he cheated twice. And then not only did he cheat twice, the second time he got busted with the whole biogenesis scandal. Do you remember how he tried to sue Bud Selig, Rob Manfred, Major League Baseball, the Players Association? As far as we know, he probably tried to sue the equipment managers too. I mean, that's how pathetic he was. And in spite of all of that, I have to admit to you, when he said that the end was near, I was willing to shove all of that aside. And I was willing to say, you know what? That's the past. He still got 696 home runs. He still has over 3,000 hits and over 2,000 RBIs. 
He still has more grand slams than anyone in, in Major League Baseball history. Get over it. And then he had that press conference yesterday. Fake crocodile tears. Just as phony and fraudulent and duplicitous as it gets. I mean, th- does this guy want to be Derek Jeter or what? Derek Jeter marched into the twilight. Living an inscrutable lifestyle, as my man Wally Matthews echoed it. Wrote on his column, ESPNNewYork.com. Go check it out. I mean, Derek Jeter, his personal life is impenetrable. Because he did things the right way. He was committed to his craft, honored his craft by doing things the right way as much as he possibly could and kept his private life private. A-Rod, one minute is Karen Diaz, another minute is Kate Hudson. Another minute, it's his divorce, and he's bringing up his two daughters. Another minute, he's dating someone else. I I mean, none of that's our business. A-Rod made it all our business. All in an effort to manipulate us to some degree and be about dictating and spinning his image. All disgraceful. All disgraceful. I don't know how y'all put it up. I don't know how y'all y'all put up with it. I really, really don't. I don't want to see A-Rod again. And by the way, why the hell aren't you just ending it now? What the hell are you waiting for this Friday for? For what? And by the way, when you play Friday, I, I mean, was he looking to end it? Like, you think you're going to get the applause that Derek Jeter got? You think you're going to hit some game-winning hit? I hope you do, but I doubt you will. He had every chance. By the way, wasn't he reading a statement? I think he was. It looked like he was reading a statement. Where's the Where's the authenticity? Where's the genuineness? Where's the realness? To the end, he went out looking like a phony. And that's what bothers me. Because I wanted to give him every chance, and he just looked like a fake phony. Just made me sick to my stomach. Triple Eight Mad Dog Six is the number to call up. That's eight 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 six two three three six four six. I'm so sick of him. Just go away. Come to Major League Baseball. Go to Fox. Do your 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 color analysis. You you were great at that. Just get us away from talking about you, the player. It's over. And the only one responsible for tainting you is you. Triple A Mad Dog Six is always the number to call up. This eight 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 six two three three six four six. Watching the news, watching protesters interrupt Donald Trump during his speech. Looking at news about Hillary Clinton criticizing Donald Trump's economic plan. Looking at all of that, but I got Tony Dungy on my mind too. I actually heard folks questioning whether or not Tony Dungy, the great Tony Dungy, would be a Hall of Famer if he were a white coach. You'll be surprised by my answer when I reveal it next. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show, Sirius XM, Mad Dog Sports Radio, Channel 82. Before I get to the phones, this morning on First Take, I decided to address a subject that I listened to as I was... um, driving around throughout this weekend, listening to sports talk radio, listening to Mad Dog Radio, listening to the Bleacher Report, listening to ESPN Radio and beyond, uh, listening to some political pundits that, you know, wanted to throw a little sports into the equation for a second or two, mentioning it. And they talked about Hall of Famers, the Brett Favs of the world, the Orlando Paces of the world, uh, Marvin Harrison, etc. leading the class of 2016. Congratulations to them all. Uh, as much of a critic as I am of the prima donna that was Brett Favre in the last three to four years of his career, make no mistake about it, I've never failed to recognize his greatness. 
Uh, he's one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history. He passed over 70,000 yards. He's won a Super Bowl, went to two Super Bowls, went to a few NFC championship games. Uh, he was a phenomenal competitor and an Iron Man, and he deserves my respect along with that of everybody else's. I'm happy for him. Um, it was very, very moving to hear him talk about how <clears throat> he wanted to make his dad proud. Um, that's how I feel about my mama, wanting to make her proud. Uh, but Brett Favre is a special, special athlete, special quarterback. Um, has always and will always have my respect. I just thought he was a prima donna the last three or four years, and I had fun with that. But I've never failed to recognize his greatness. He truly, truly was great, and he was a treasure for the NFL and should have been honored the way that he was honored over the past weekend. Marvin Harrison was great, too. So was Tony Dungy, so was Orlando Pace and all of these guys. But let me say this. <clears throat> Listening to Sports Talk Radio and others, there was a question that I thought would be perceived as very uh, polarizing or whatever. I didn't ask it. Others were saying it. They asked a question, facetiously, I might add, if Tony Dungy were white, would he be a Hall of Famer? Interesting question. Because here's the deal. The answer is probably no. Let's put it in its proper perspective. The answer is probably no. Because Tom Flores has two Super Bowl titles. He's not in the Hall of Fame. Jimmy Johnson has two Super Bowl titles. He's not in the Hall of Fame. Mike Shanahan has two rings. He's not in the Hall of Fame. John Gruden has a ring. He's not in the Hall of Fame. Dick Vermeil has a ring. He's not in the Hall of Fame. You have to look at it like that. Barry Switzer has a Super Bowl title. He's not in the Hall of Fame. That's how most people look at it. And as a result, they say if Tony Dungy were white, he wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Here's my point to you. You're possibly right. But you're so wrong. Because you can't ignore what Tony Dungy means to the game of football. What he means to sports overall. And what he means to a disenfranchised community that makes up about 13% of the American population. That is the black community. Tony Dungy has a career record of 139 and 69. That means he's won 66.8% of his games. In 13 years as a head coach, he's had one losing season. Another, he was 500. He was 6 and 10 his very first season as a head coach, coaching the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 1996. He was 8 and 8 with the Bucks in 1998, two years later. Outside of that, with the exception of 2001, where the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were 9-7, and seven, Tony Dungy won a minimum of 10 games. He won double digits every year. So of his 13 years as an NFL head coach, he's only had one losing season. He's only had two seasons where he was 500 or less. And he's only had three years where he didn't win double digits. The other 10 were all double digit seasons, a minimum of 10 victories. 10 victories in 1997 with Tampa Bay, 11 victories in 1999 with Tampa Bay, 10 victories in 2000 with Tampa Bay. And when he went to Indianapolis with Peyton Manning, he had 10, 12, 12, 14, 12, 13, and 12 and won a Super Bowl title in 2006, becoming the first African-American in the history of America to win a Super Bowl championship as a head coach. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, Tony Dungy's the Jackie Robinson of NFL coaches. Not in terms of integrating the sport as a head coach, because we all know that's our shell. I'm talking about winning the Super Bowl title. Let's take it a step further. Tony Dungy quarterback at the University of Minnesota for three years. Did a pretty damn good job quarterbacking them as well. 
wasn't drafted in 1977. Got picked up by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Only played three NFL seasons. But one of them was with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Actually, two of them. It was in 1978. Do you know what year that was? That was when the Steelers went 14-2 and and won the Super Bowl title, beating the Dallas Cowboys. Remember when Jackie Slater dropped that ball, hit him right in his chest from Roger Starback, and he dropped it? Ladies and gentlemen, there was a player who led the Steelers in interceptions. Do you know who that player was? It was Tony Dungy. Playing in the field, in the back, in, in the secondary, with Mel Blunt and Ron Johnson. Playing alongside linebackers Jack Lambert and Jack Ham. Playing alongside Donnie Shell. That Tony Dungy. Did you know that? Did you know that? By the way, Tony Dungy led the team in interceptions. You know why? Because he was a free safety. You know why he was a free safety? Because they didn't believe his arm was strong enough and he would be good enough coming out of Minnesota to play quarterback on the NFL level because back then, black quarterbacks weren't given a fair stake. Did you know that? Did you know that after that, Tony Dungy became the youngest defensive coordinator for the Pittsburgh Steelers in 84? even though he retired in like 78, 79? Did you know that he ultimately got lost that job, landed in Kansas City, then became a defensive coordinator in Minnesota before landing the head coach job in Tampa, and then ultimately going on to Indianapolis? Did you know that it took Tony Dungy nearly two decades to get a look? Do you know that it took him nearly 28 years to get the recognition that he deserved? Did you know that Tony Dungy was practically a lone ranger fighting on behalf of African-Americans who were denied one opportunity after another after another in terms of getting a look as a head coach? Did you know that Lovey Smith was a mentee of Tony Dungy? who Tony Dungy beat to win the Super Bowl championship. Do you know that just the other day when I was talking to Mike Tomlin, one of the people he thanked most was Tony Dungy? Do you know how many lives Tony Dungy has positively impacted in his fight for equality? Did you know that? I'm going to assume that my white colleagues in this business, fantastic at what they do, no doubt conscientious, and appreciative of the greatness of Tony Dungy. All know what I've just said. And I want to say for the record that none of them were chiding Tony Dungy or acting like he was undeserving. They acknowledged something that, quite frankly, is probably true. If he were white, he would be one of the guys that may not have made the Hall of Fame. What I respectfully submit they didn't do enough of, however, which is why I felt the need to do it, is highlight that while his blackness may have had everything to do with him being a Hall of Famer, it's because of what he had to endure as a black man, which is something his white counterparts would never have to endure. And it's because of that intestinal fortitude. It is because of that perseverance. It is because of that tenacity. It is because of that unrelenting, unwavering commitment to being all that he could be, not just for himself, but for the Tony Dungies like Lovey Smith and Mike Tomlin and beyond to follow. And it's also for people like me to be over the airwaves, articulating, Elocuting and enunciating the things that people who look differently than me, may speak differently than me, may think differently than me, may have failed to explain. I didn't think they did that this weekend. So I felt the need to do so myself. Tony Dungy is an iconic figure. A special, special man 
on so many levels. And no matter how much you appreciate him, and I'm sure they all do, I'm sure all of us do. I just wanted America to understand, the international community listening to Sirius XM Mad Dog Sports Radio, to understand that there is a special level of appreciation that black folks have for Tony Dungy. You all might just look at his record and see the 66.8 winning percentage. We look at what he had to go through to get there. We didn't need Tony Dungy to officially become a Hall of Famer for that to be confirmed. He always was a Hall of Famer in our minds. It was just nice to finally see him recognized by others for something we've always seen him as ourselves. Triple Eight Mad Dog Six is the number to call up. This eight 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 six two three three six four six. Your phone calls and more coming up next, right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, Sirius XM Mad Dog Sports Radio, Channel eighty two. Michael Jordan compared Russell Westbrook to his younger self. I'll be talking about that and 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 more in hour number two. Steve Kerr has some things to say about Kevin Durant and those of us who feel he's a villain. I'll be talking about that in hour number two as well. Before I get to the phone calls at Triple Eight Mad Dog Six, that's eight 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 six two three three six four six. Let me compare some of those out there who will bring up Tony Dungy and my comments about him. Let me justify my point here. Let's go down the list. Mike Shanahan, two Super Bowl titles, 20 seasons. His record is 170 and 138. He's won 55% of his games. Jimmy Johnson only coached nine seasons in Dallas and Miami. 80 and 64 overall, only won 56% of his games. Not only, because that's respectable. John Gruden coached 11 seasons, Oakland and Tampa. 95 and 81, 54% of his games, he won. Tom Flores, 12 seasons, primarily with the Raiders. 97 and 87, won 53% of his games. Dick Vermeil, 15 seasons. Philadelphia, St. Louis. Kansas City, if I remember correctly, 120-109, won 52% of his games, won a Super Bowl title. Bill Cowher went to two Super Bowls, won one Super Bowl title, 161-99-1, and won 62% of his games. He's the closest to Dungy. And Mike Holmgren, 17 seasons, 161-111, he won 59% of his games. That is what Mike Holmgren did. Now, once again, Tony Dungy, 139 and 69, won 66.8% of his games. Numbers alone, he warrants Hall of Fame, as far as I'm concerned. But, like I said, the reason why I said if he was white, he probably wouldn't have made it because they would have said, hell, we got to put it. We got to put some of those other guys in there. Kyle has got a Super Bowl title and more Super Bowl appearances. Shanahan's got more Super Bowl titles. Jimmy Johnson has more Super Bowl titles. Tom Flores has more Super Bowl titles. We got to put one of them in there before Dungy. So a legitimate argument could be made that his blackness actually helped him get into the hall earlier than them. What I'm saying is, so what? He won nearly 67% of his games. He won a Super Bowl, and none of them, absolutely positively none of them, had to go through what he had to go through in order to become a head coach, let alone win a Super Bowl title. None of them. Tony Dungy deserves this. I'm not saying that anybody is out there ridiculing him as a Hall of Famer. I'm not trying to imply that. Nobody did that. Not the shows I was listening to. No one did that. But as y'all know in this business, when it comes to black folks, particularly on the national radio platform, ain't too many of us. So somebody had to make sure they said it. Here I am. Triple Eight Mad Dog Six is always the number to call up. This eight 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 six two three three six four six. First hour, first forty five minutes or so, we talked about the Hall of Fame game getting canceled. 
How the NFL dropped the ball on that more so than anybody else. We talked about A-Rod and his fake, phony, fraudulent self. And, of course, we talked about Tony Dungy. Let's go to Larry in South Dakota. You're live with Stephen A. on Mad Dog. Larry, good afternoon. How are you? How's it going, Stephen? I'm doing great. Thank you for calling. Good afternoon. What's up? Hey, first off, I want to say that thank you for what you said about Tony Dungy because I think it, it was it was mandatory that it needs to be said. You know, that it's what he's done that, 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 that raises him above everybody else. Yes, sir. And what he had to go through. And what he had to go through. Yep. But, uh, I mean, I guess it's sad that we got to bring up the fact if he wasn't black, Hey, man, I got to cut you off. Larry, let me cut you off. Call back right now if you can or at the the top of the second hour. Your signal's not clear at all. I want to make sure my audience hears you. So uh, they can't hear you right now. So I'm going to come back to your calls in just a few. Let's go to Trucker D in Michigan. You're live with Stephen A. or Mad Dog. Trucker D, what's going on, bro? How are you? What's going on, Stephen A? All right, um, can you step back? Can you step? Can you step back? Hold on, step back. Hold on, step back from the microphone just a little bit because you sound muffled. Go ahead. Okay, I just want to add to that comment in Tony Dungy. Uh, he got in there because he got an inch and he turned into a mile. Um, that's one of the reasons. And um, Jeff Fisher is going to be in the Hall of Fame too. What? He, he had a job for this long. Oh, you just said that to make NFL. me laugh, right? You just said that to make me laugh, right? You mean Jeff Fisher's been coaching in the NFL for 21 years and has missed the playoffs in 15 he's, of those years? Trucker D, Trucker D, I'm a serious brother. I'm in a serious mood. I don't like jokes like that. That's a joke. You know, say, admit you're joking. Admit you're joking. It's, I'm joking. I'm okay, joking. okay, okay. They're, they're don't, don't, don't have my audience thinking that you. Don't have my audience thinking that you're so serious. And he would have got in, but those other guys would have got it in front of him. He just got in because of he had an inch and he turned into a mile, and and he deserved it. The other guys are going to get in. Thank you. I didn't call about that though. I called about A Rod. Go ahead. Um, you know, A Rod got me start watching baseball again. When the ball was coming out of the park and there was guys in canoes jumping in the water to get the ball, that was exciting. So if baseball is about history, putting all those guys. And, and document the history. I'll give the money back and take away everything from them. Mm. This is plain and simple. Okay. I got it. I appreciate the call, man. Thank you. Dennis in Queens, you're live with Stephen A. on Mad Dog. What's up, Dennis? Hey, how you doing, Stephen A., first-time um, caller? Thank you, man. Go ahead. All right. Yeah, I want to talk about A-Rod. I understand where you're coming from about the steroids and stuff like that, but he was still a great player. And I'm a Yankee fan myself, and then before – when, he was, when they traded for him, I was excited for this guy because in 2009, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have won the World Series that year. Well, let's be clear. Let, let, let's be clear about something, Dennis. Um, I acknowledge right. that, like my producer, and I even confessed when I was on on first take this morning. Look, I don't, I right. you know, talent wise, I can't deny that about a Rod. My issue was is that with that phony press conference yesterday with all of those emotions, it, it, it reminded me of how phony and fraudulent he could be. And it got me away from thinking about his numbers and reminded me instead of how fake, phony, and fraudulent he can be. And that's what ticked me off. He's like, he's, he's like, he makes like baseball exciting. Like he's like one of my, besides Derek, Hold on, he's, he's let one me ask you a question. Players. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time he made baseball exciting for you? When's the last time? 2009, but no one's hitting on the team, though. You can't recognize half of these guys. Well, I'm just saying. Uh, like he's, he's, a ra- he's a ratings card. Yeah, Everybody but... but the game to watch him. But why, would you, are you sure about that? Since when? No one goes to watch the games because uh, of Didi DeGorius or, or Aaron Hicks. They go to watch A-Rod. They, uh, that that you game mean, Friday you mean night even, probably sold mean, out just you, because of him. You mean even now? You mean even now they felt that way? Even now, I'm I gotta telling see, you. I got to see it to believe it. Who, who do you think is better, yeah. him or Derek Jeter? L- listen, I think that Alex Rodriguez is better if you're looking at overall numbers. But I don't believe that A-Rod showed up in the clutch his last three years in the playoffs. He batted 111 twice against Detroit and 125 against Baltimore. And other, with the exception of 2009, he repeatedly choked in the pro season. You know this. You know this, Dennis. He did choke. He did choke, but his first year when he came to the Yankees in 2004 against the Twins, he played well in that series. 
Oh, you I play got well. Oh, I got it. You got me there. Two thousand and four. How many? <laughs> how many years? How many years ago is that? That's where you going? In two thousand and four, Alex Rodriguez <laughs> showed up in the post. See, y'all just doing this to mess with me. I don't appreciate this because y'all supposed to be showing me some love, Dennis. Especially you, who's supposed to be a homeboy from Queens, New York, just like I am. But clearly, right. but clearly, you're my enemy because here's the deal. You just calling up to mess with me because you know that's a bunch of nonsense. A Rod in two thousand and four. Who cares? And the guy, he's a, he was the best player on the team. Hold on, hold on. He was the top 10 player of all time. Hold on. In four games in 2004 right. against Minnesota, he batted 421. You got me there. What did he do in the ALCS against Boston? Uh, that game, that game was the pitching. The starting pitching oh, was that serious. You know, and and Mo Blue has saved. Oh, really? Like That's where we're going. He's, he's the reason why they lost. Hold on. Let me get this straight. So A Rod, right. uh, you want to give me A Rod's numbers when he did well, but when I tell you he didn't, you say that was a pitching series. No, 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 that's no. what we doing. He did play bad. He did play bad against like the Angels and the Tigers. I tell you that, but everybody was struggling. Che your boy Che didn't do nothing in two thousand nine. I agree that with was that. All A Rod. Hey, listen, that was all A Rod in two thousand and nine, no doubt. But in clutch moment after clutch moment throughout the years, there's only one Derek Jeter. You better show some respect. But no, but A Rod brought him to the playoffs though. Sometimes Cheetah had come a mediocre season. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. You mean the same year A Rod admitted he was cheating? Everybody cheated. Barry Bonds cheated. See, see, all right, okay. Did like, Barry Bonds Barry Bonds cheated because he got jealous of all the notoriety Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa was getting when they couldn't shine his shoes and he was a thirty for thirty guy. But then he wanted to hit more home runs because that's what we were paying attention to. But as a complete baller, they weren't even on his level. And that's the fact. And you know it. Barry Bonds. Goodbye, man. Have a nice day. Let's go to Reggie in Washington, D.C. You're live with Stephen A. Amanda. What's up, Reg? Hey, Steve. How are you, man? How you doing, bro? Now, don't you think that uh, before Tony Dungy left Tampa, that was his Super Bowl? Yeah, that's what I said. My man, my man. I always give him props. I always give him props. Just one to give you props. Hey, listen, listen, listen. I give Tony Dungy props for John Gruden. Uh, winning the Super Bowl. John Drew, you don't take anything away from John Gruden because there's something to be said about him not messing it up. But but sure, the fact sure. is, Tony Dungy deserves credit, just like Mark Jackson deserves credit for what Steve Kerr was able to do in Golden State. Now, that doesn't mean you take any credit away from Steve Kerr, who's proven to be a great coach. But Mark Jackson, let's not negate the job that he did in positioning that franchise to be where they are. I agree. I agree. Appreciate, you, appreciate the call. Thank you. Dennis in New Jersey. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Dennis? How you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for calling. Go ahead, buddy. I got a question. I would, I'm a Redskin fan, and I was just listening to you the other day by talking about the Redskins. Yes, sir. Uh, I know that I ordered some uh, NFL stuff off the computer from the NFL uh, place. They sent me the, everything, but they didn't send me the Redskins name. Okay. They don't even. They don't even have. Uh, they're not even showing none of the Redskins jackets well, well, or nothing on the NFL television. Yeah, because because stuff. because folks have been in an uproar because the Native American community. Uh, you know, obviously it's a very polarizing issue because there are people out there who believe uh, that the NFL. Um, that the, I'm sorry, that the Redskins is a racist name. <clears throat> I work every morning on, uh, on first ESPN 2's first take. On ESPN 2 comes on every morning at 10 a.m. to 12 noon. My partner, Max Kellerman, my new partner, refuses to mention their name. He calls them the team from Washington because you have a lot of people out there uh, that are very empathetic to the Native American community. And no matter how much the Hispanic, uh, the Latino, uh, the black community, no matter how much we've been diminished or ostracized in the, in the minds of the American public and the American fabric, no one has suffered more than the native, the native American community. They've been completely obliterated. And so because of that, you have a lot of people who feel that they're voiceless. As a result, they want to give a voice to them. And if a vast majority of them feel that the Redskin name is a racist name, there are people in here who've adopted that mentality and refuse to embrace it. Okay. Let me ask you another question. What's wrong? Why they don't uh, like the Florida Seminoles 
Ain't that the Indian name? <clears throat> well, a lot of people are feeling they're bringing all of that into the equation. They're bringing the Cleveland Indians. They're bringing in the Atlanta Braves. They're bringing in the Florida Seminoles. They're bringing in a lot of different things. But I think that what brought an additional elevated level of attention to the matter is that Dan- Daniel Snyder, the owner of the Washington Redskins, first of all, it's the NFL. It's king right now. They're a multi-billion dollar conglomerate. Secondly, and more importantly, you also look at it from the perspective and the standpoint that if you're Daniel Snyder, you came out and publicly declared you'll never change the name. You won't do anything uh, to change the name. So he came across in the eyes of some critics as incredibly insensitive to the matter, which hardened their position against him. And the NFL has to pay attention to that. Okay. One one more question. I try to get you on. Uh, you're not on first take on the radio no more. Uh, first take, I don't believe, is on the radio. Uh, first take is on television, on ESPN okay. two, um, and I'm on radio at one o'clock to three o'clock every single day. Plus, it re-airs from one to three as well. So we're not hard to find. I think we, I think it's back on today, though. I think it's back on Sirius XM today. I think you can find us um, on Sirius XM today. I think what what channel is that, Nuno? Channel eighty one, sir. Channel eighty one. What time, Nuno? Ten o'clock. It is on the radio at ten a.m. as well. Alrighty. Okay. Alrighty. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right. I didn't even know that. My producer extraordinaire, Nuno Texiera, told me that. I didn't even. They didn't even let me know that. They told my producer, but they didn't tell me. So we come on Sirius XM channel eighty one, meaning first take on ESPN two television. We're also on Sirius XM channel eighty one radio at ten a.m. every morning as well. So check that out. Hour number two up next, Michael Jordan, complimentary of our Russell Westbrook. Steve Kerr, very supportive of Kevin Durant. This is Michael Breed. On Mad Dog Sports Radio, 888-MAD-DOG-6 is over. The number to call up is 888-623-3646. Bit of news for you. Hugh Jackson, new coach for the Cleveland Browns, announced today that RG3 would be the team's starting quarterback entering week one. Uh, he's going to be the starting quarterback for the team. Personal opinion, so what? Fact of the matter is, there was no surprise here. There's nothing newsworthy here as far as I'm concerned. Who the hell didn't know RG3 is going to be the starter? You got him from Washington. Um, <clears throat> not only did you do that, uh, but you also have a situation where Josh Gordon has returned. So Josh Gordon returns, okay? That's your college teammate. He's clearly the best player on the team when healthy and sober. And not inebriated in any way. So it's a foregone conclusion that this is going to be RG3's team. Nobody's surprised there. Nobody needs to be surprised there. It is what it is. Triple A Mad Dog 6 is always the number to call up. This 888-623-3646. I'm still wondering what Cleveland's going to do. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, you really, really think they're not coming in last place? I know Gary Barnage had a breakout season last year. He had about a 9 and 79 receptions for over 1,000 yards. So what? Joe Thomas, I'm sorry, Josh Gordon is there. Let's see what he does. We get all of that. Duke Johnson can run the football decently well. Brian Hartline, Andre Hawkins, let's see what they do. But in the end, what it comes down to is how can you take anything for granted with Cleveland? Look, they're in the AFC North. And by virtue of the fact that they're in the AFC North, okay, what do you think they're going to do? You really think they're going to be better than Pittsburgh? You really think that? You really think they're going to be better than the Cincinnati Bengals or the Baltimore Ravens? I don't think so. I'm telling you that right now. So it doesn't matter to me what RG3 does. I just don't believe in my heart of hearts that RG3 and Josh Gordon are going to be be able to do enough to offset them coming in last place in the AFC North. It's just that simple. Another thing I want to touch to right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, Series 6 and Mad Dog Sports Radio. Michael Jordan made news again today. Um, he decided to uh, praise one of his uh, clients for the Jordan brand, Russell Westbrook who recently agreed to a three-year deal with the Oklahoma City Thunder to stay in Oklahoma City at least for the next year or two. Michael Jordan is widely regarded as the greatest player ever. He won six championships, six finals MVPs, five league MVPs, ten scoring titles. He even won a Defensive Player of the Year award along the way. 
But Michael Jordan, listen to what he had to say about Russell Westbrook. Quote, 30 years ago, that's me, he said of Westbrook. The attitude, trying to prove myself, showing so much passion for the game of basketball. You see it in his play. You can tell he loves the game. He plays with energy and flair. That's what he said. This is Westbrook's response when told of what Michael Jordan had to say about him. That's crazy. I really don't know what to say. To have the best player who ever played the game to say that about you as a player and as a person is something that is going to keep me striving. Let me say this. <sighs> Michael Jordan's right. Now, I know people are sitting there and they're looking at it and they're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Russell Westbrook, he doesn't even have a ring yet. Russell Westbrook is a superstar. Russell Westbrook is the most athletic point guard in the history of basketball. Russell Westbrook is the greatest assassin in the game today. There is no more ruthless competitor in all of sports than Russell Westbrook right now, at least in the, on the NBA level. Nobody. There's nobody that gives you the impression that they will literally cut your heart out if they could just to win. That's Russell Westbrook. That was Michael Jordan. And when I look at it from that perspective, I got nothing but affirmation attached to me when I think about what Michael Jordan had to say about Russell Westbrook. Here's where it goes a bit awry. Michael Jordan spent the last nine years not even averaging three turnovers a game. Nine years of his career, not even averaging three turnovers a game. Russell Westbrook's averaged four-plus turnovers a game his last two years. That's a big deal. Russell Westbrook can be very erratic. His erratic play gets in the way, and as a result, it inhibits his aggression to some degree. That's a big, big deal. Without question. We can slice it any way we want to. That is the reality of the situation. Russell Westbrook's erratic. Michael Jordan was never erratic. And that erratic play at times gets in the way of his productivity. You can never say that about Michael Jordan. Doesn't, but still, Russell Westbrook's great. And I want to make sure we all understand that I know this. I think Russell Westbrook is going to win the MVP this upcoming season. I think he's the guy to watch as an individual. I think Russell Westbrook is going to wreak havoc, wreck shop, and God knows what he's going to do to so many people. It's something special. And uh, it's just how I feel about it. Now, here's where things get interesting. Steve Kerr is on the record saying that, um, it's insane for Kevin Durant to be viewed as a villain. I believe we have sound from Steve Kerr on uh, Michelle Beadle and uh, Ramona Shelburne's uh, radio show. And uh, Steve Kerr was being interviewed by them. And about as it, as it pertains to Kevin Durant being a villain, Here's what he had to say. Listen to Steve Kerr, the coach of the Golden State Warriors, coming to the defense of his newest acquisition. Honestly, to, to think of Kevin Durant or Steph Curry or really, you know, any of our guys as villains, it's it's kind of absurd. But especially Kevin. I mean, this is one of the most likable people in the league. He's been obviously an incredible player, but just an awesome human being and, and what he did in Oklahoma City was just amazing for that community and um, circumstances sort of dictate I guess that some people are going to view him as a as a villain but it's kind of crazy it's it's only because you know he just decided to go elsewhere to play because he wanted to change the scenery he wanted a new challenge you know more than anything he wanted to play with our guys he, he loves Draymond and Steph and Clay and Andre he, he loved Seeing those guys in New York, he, he loved seeing the chemistry that exists, and I think he really wanted to be a part of it. So, you know, people are going to view him how, however they want, but I think we all know what kind of person he is and, and um, what kind of impact he's had around the league. 
Steve Kerr is wrong. I say that respectfully. And sometimes, whether it's the coaches or it's the general managers like Sam Presti years ago coming to the defense of Kevin Durant, they take stuff too far. It gets a bit annoying. Remember that time when, you know, Kevin Durant spoke out and then the media tried to call him on it and then and then uh Sam Presti brought up Kevin Durant's contributions and what he did, you know, when 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 the tornado or the hurricane came through Oklahoma. That's not what everybody was talking about. Everybody knows Kevin Durant's a good guy. Everybody knows that he's not a bad person. Everybody knows he's a great player and a great basketball ambassador. If Steve Kerr truly feels that way, why don't you tell that to the folks in Oklahoma City? How do you think they feel about him right now? You think they don't know what a great person Kevin Durant was? But it hurts that he left them. And because he left them, he's the villain. Because a villain doesn't mean you're a criminal. A villain doesn't mean you're a despicable human being. Someone who is villainous is someone who's giving you an excuse to dislike them because of something they have done. Is Oklahoma City or basketball fans, for that matter, supposed to like what Kevin Durant did? Can we be truthful and real about this? I'm going to say something. It is possible, not a finished product, but it is possible that Kevin Durant may have flat out ruined the entire 2016-2017 NBA regular season. It is possible he may have ruined it. Do y'all understand the magnitude of that? Tell me, ladies and gentlemen, what's suspenseful to watch for this upcoming season? When you are that loaded, so loaded, that everybody else appears to be the equivalent of a junior varsity team compared to you. Where's the suspense? That's what Kevin Durant did with one move. Ladies and gentlemen, he could have gone to Miami. He could have gone to New York. And you know what we would have said? Okay, Kevin Lebr- Kevin Durant versus LeBron James. He could have gone to San Antonio or stayed in OKC. We would have said, okay, let's see what the Warriors do this time. Instead, he joined the team that beat him. Stripping us all of the suspense of an entire NBA season, arguably. I literally already have my flight arrangements and hotel reservations for next June. Why even bother? Who's going to beat them? Cleveland only a team that has a chance. Am I supposed to believe that Paul Gasol joining LaMarcus Aldridge, he's going to have a chance? Am I supposed to believe that? Really? I can't. I can't believe that. Am I supposed to believe that Blake Griffin and CP3 and DeAndre Jordan are suddenly going to be good enough to be the Golden State Warriors team we suspected they weren't good enough to beat last year? Now that you've added Kevin Durant in place of Harrison Barnes? Am I supposed to believe that? Am I supposed to believe that Mike Conley Jr. making $153 million is going to make Memphis better? Or Anthony Davis making $145 million is going to make New Orleans better? Or C.J. McCollum getting his max deal to join to, to pair up with Damian Lillard again is going to make Portland better? What am I supposed to do? Why do you think the commissioner, Adam Silver, wasn't too fond of the move? Why do you think there's rumors circulating that the NBA is going to see what it can do to limit these kind of things from happening in future collective bargaining negotiations? Not that they'll pull it off, but you know what I'm saying. It's just unfortunate. He has every right to do what he did. He didn't do anything wrong 
He didn't do anything wrong to me. He didn't do anything wrong to you. He didn't do anything wrong to the fans. Kevin Durant didn't do anything wrong. We're just basketball fans, Steve Kerr. We're just basketball fans that wanted to see competitive fervor. Michael Jordan had to chase, had to shrug off Boston and then chase Detroit. After they did that, and they started winning championships. Even though they were the favorites, we kind of thought New York had a chance with their roughhouse tactics with Anthony Mason, God rest his soul, and Charles Oakley, and Patrick Ewan and Starks and Derek Harper and Rolando Blackman and those boys. We kind of thought they had a chance. What do we have now? And even though the Lakers were the favorites, you didn't have both conferences with foregone conclusions. You didn't have that. Come on. I'm just saying. It's a hard pill to swallow, y'all. It just is. Triple Eight Mad Dog Six is the number to call up. This eight 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 six two three. Mad Dog Sports Radio. Triple Eight Mad Dog Six is always the number to call up. That's eight 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 six two three three six four six. Back to the phones we go. At Triple Eight Mad Dog Six. That's eight 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 six two three three six four six. Let's go to Ken in New York. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Ken? Hey, Stephen A. Long time listener. Uh, I listen to you almost every day. I just need to respectfully disagree about Russell Westbrook winning MVP next season. Sure. I don't. I don't see how he's gonna with no Kevin Durant. Um, well, that's because he's gonna get them. He's gonna get half those shots. <laughs> you know, true, what I'm true. I mean, he's the one that's gonna be. What you think he's gonna give those same amount of shots to Victor Oladipo? Oladipo? No, no but I, I just think all the other uh, team defense is gonna key on him. I mean, there's one less superstar to worry about. I gotta admit to you, it's hard for a defense to key on somebody like Russell Westbrook with his athleticism, his speed, his burst, his aggression with the ball always in his hands. I think the big, the, don't get me wrong, I don't think he was, he's better for it, but I think the biggest impediment to his offensive prowess and success was the, uh, uh, was the presence of Kevin Durant. I think with Kevin Durant gone, he's gonna be unleashed to do even more offensively. He'll have to carry a load more times than not. He may come up short. But not statistically. Statistically, he's going to get off. Russell Westbrook is going to average a minimum of 25 to 26 a game. I guess right. we just have to wait and see. You I got to wait and see. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you so much. Let's go to Big Ace in Columbus. You're live with Stephen A. on Mad Dog. What's up, Big Ace? How are you? All right, Stephen A. How about you? I'm good. Thank you for calling. What's up? Well, I think the funniest uh thing I got from that Steve Kerr comment was the one particular line. He wants a change of scenery and a new challenge. New challenge? Like he didn't have a challenge enough trying to beat his new team, which he almost did? I mean, what a joke that is. Mm -hmm. And you're right about next season. Um, the only interest there is is to hopefully see them lose. Every night I'll be rooting for them to lose. Um, a dream scenario, which I'm surprised nobody's mentioned yet, including yourself, because it's unlikely to happen, but could you imagine if somehow Western Conference Finals Oklahoma City could knock off Golden State? Oh, my I'd God. I'd pay money. Oh, that would I'd be crazy. Money. That would be crazy. That would be crazy. Just amazing. It'd be like the Cavs winning it this year, you know, like that type of feeling, but even better to me. And uh, one last thing, Stephen A., like about Tony Dungy. Um, this I think this is society in general, like, I wouldn't have even thought about what was brought up by either yourself or a caller I tuned in about an hour ago. Um, I, it didn't even occur to me. Well, it makes a little sense because he's black. It helps him. The only, I just think the more we talk about race sometimes, the more these issues come up when it wouldn't have even really than something I would have thought about. I'm in the minority, maybe, but does that make any sense to you? Well, it makes sense to me that you would feel that way. It just doesn't make it accurate. The fact of the matter yeah. is sometimes things exist but are not spoken about.
Sometimes it comes out of the mouths of the few, but it's felt by the many. And as a result, you know, you got to address it because it's what we do for a living. You know, you don't sit on the air and, and put blindfolders on and act like, you know, stuff doesn't exist as it pertains to, you know, whatever. You know, it, the issues are the issues and you can't ignore that. And when people make statements, then, you know, if you have a counterpoint, then make your counterpoint. Do so respectfully. You don't take offense to anybody's position, but I think the world would be a better place. If we were able to talk openly about it, that's why when white individuals call up on this show and they happen to uh, disagree, <clears throat> excuse me, or have a different perspective than I do, I go out of my way to let them make their point and to uh, alert them to how I don't take offense to what they're saying because I appreciate them calling up and being candid about right. what their positions are. But at the same time, coming from a different community than theirs, I'd like to give a different and healthy perspective to it so they'll understand how the other side feels because the more ga- the more understanding that we gather amongst one another, the less animosity will exist, and therefore we can truly all get along instead of just preaching about doing so. And one last thing, if I can. Yeah. Um, did they uh, did they mention about that paint? Why it was harmful to the players last night? What was the the big deal? Why they said, said that they, they said that the paint the paint congealed, meaning it hardened. So as a result, when you're spray painting, you know, logos or whatever it is on midfield or, right. or spray painting the name on the end zone, it it turned hard like cement. As a result, it didn't give. So imagine if you got tackled on something like that. It could right. cause injury. Or if you were running and then all of a sudden you're running on grass and then a second later you step on a hard surface and your knee buckles or gives out. It can yeah, be it very, quite, very dangerous. So that, that, right. that, that that's what happened, and that's why they couldn't allow them to play on it. Hey, and real quick, uh, I like Max as a replacement. The show's great. I'm watching every day still. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate the love. Thank you so much, Big Ace. Appreciate it. Call back anytime. Let's go to Andre in Atlanta. You're live with Stephen A. Mad Dog. Dre, what's up, baby? How are you doing? What's up, Stephen? How are you doing? I'm good. Talk to me, man. Hey, so since a lot of people like to bring up LeBron going to Miami, yep. I just wanted to clarify this real quick. When LeBron went to Miami, he, yes, he eliminated Cleveland from being contenders, but it also birthed Miami. And um, the balance of power was still intact, you know, because um, LeBron, he still had to deal with Indiana, who was on the rise. He had to deal with Boston, Indiana and Boston. Boston and also Chicago for a minute, too. Yep. So it, so because the of Derrick of Rose, Joe Kim Noah, and the crew with Tom Thibodeau coaching them. Yep. So, um, so that's the difference between that right there, because when Kevin Durant, he, yes, he eliminated OKC, but... Golden State didn't need him to be a contender. Mm -hmm. And now, like, you just got San Antonio and Clippers. Like, that's not going to happen. Like, if they couldn't beat them before, they can't beat them. They definitely can't beat them now. Excellent point. Excellent point by you. Mm Mm-hmm. So um, that's what I just want to bring up because people just don't seem to understand. They just want to bring it back to LeBron. But, like, it's completely different. So, yeah, that's just what I wanted to bring up. And another point, um... Since I'm a Laker fan, you know, we got a really, really young team right now. You know, we got D'Angelo, we got Brandon Ingram, we got Julius Randle. Um, do you think it is possible for this young team with Luke Walton at the helm that they could possibly grow into something a la the same way OKC did with Russell, KD, and Maybe, Jay maybe, maybe, but I, I don't think that Brandon Ingram is that guy. I think he's a very talented player, but he'd have to really uh, excel and, 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 and grow into being something big time. I think the Philadelphia 76ers with Ben Simmons has the potential to be special, man, down the line. There's no doubt mm-hmm. in my mind. We'll see what happens. But I got to go, Dre, and I appreciate the call, buddy. Let's go to Adrian in Houston. You're live with Stephen A. Maddox. What's up, Adrian? Uh, yeah, how you doing, Stephen? Hey, uh, fan. And, uh, you know, I think you're one of the greatest sports minds of our generation, but sometimes, you know, I question you, man. With this whole KD thing, I, I just don't understand where you're coming from with this. It almost seems like Rich Paul has you on his payroll to get the, uh, this this whole trash campaign against Kevin Durant. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. A couple of things. Couple of things. First of all, um, I appreciate the compliment. First things first. Uh, very nice of you to say. Secondly, just do me a favor. If you have a problem with me, don't bring up somebody else's name because nobody else makes me feel the way I feel. I don't know right. why in God's name you would bring up Rich Paul. 
That makes no sense to me. I feel the way that I feel. I don't need somebody else's confirmation in order for me to feel what I feel. What's the name of the show, Adrian? It's the Stephen A. Smith yeah, that, That's show, right. So, so there ain't Rich Paul's show or anybody else. And by the way, I don't know how in God's name Rich, name, Rich Paul's name will come up because I believe that Kevin Durant uh, put a weak move by going to the team that beat him. Where does Rich yeah, Paul I mean, figure into that equation? I don't understand. Well, Oh well, I'm saying that your uh, your praise for LeBron at times it almost seems like at times that you come to his defense and his. Well, let me age, ask you a question. A why? why then why is it? Then why is it that LeBron and I barely speak? Maybe you should call them because LeBron and I barely speak. We should say hi and bye. LeBron doesn't talk to me. He'll sit down with Rachel Nichols or Brian Winters any day before he'll talk to me. I have no problem with it. He's because it's not going. No player. Coach, executive, or anybody else will dictate what the hell I feel by intimidation or ostracizing me or not talking to me. I don't give a damn. I'm gonna say what I mean and mean what I say. But let well, me be. But, but let me be clear. LeBron hasn't gotten over the fact that I called him out for the series against Dallas, and then even then, you know, he was upset at me because of what I said that he instigated in Game Four against Draymond Green. But he's a three-time well, champion. He's been a six straight NBA Finals. He's one of the greatest players to have ever played the game. Why wouldn't I praise him? Doesn't he deserve it? Well, no. I, but I mean, you, I haven't seen you praise Kobe this way. I well, I, you, I, I'm a, well, well, first of all, I did praise Kobe that way when Kobe was winning championships. You're damn oh, right, I on, did. Stephen A., you got to be honest. Not, not the same way that you uh, praise um, LeBron. Um, Adrian, Adrian, with all due respect, I wasn't on first take. And I didn't have my own national radio show. So you don't know what the hell you're talking about because you couldn't because you didn't see me on TV like that. You see me on TV two hours a day every morning now. You hear me on radio two hours a day every afternoon. I didn't have that platform when Kobe was ring winning rings with, with Shaq. I was just getting out of my days with the Philadelphia Inquirer. That's true. I'll, I'll give you credit for that. But you were. Making your transition to being in the live. But, but, but what did I just say? I wasn't on the air for four live hours a day. Right, right. So what That's am I true. supposed to do? But I got, but I got to ask you this though. So your criticism is with KD because he said you said he uh, took the suspense out of the season. So my uh, I'm no, 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 no. Let me interrupt. Let me interrupt. Was- let me interrupt, and then I'll let you ask. Here is my exact criticism of KD. I am old school. I do not believe that you leave to go to the team who beat you in a conference finals when you are on a championship contender already. My exact words were, KD, go anywhere else but to the team that beat you and doesn't need you in order to be a contender. Go anywhere else but to them. Had he been been Golden State and then decided to leave, I wouldn't have said a word. Had he went to Miami or New York or someplace, I wouldn't have said a word. Had he gone to San Antonio, who he beat in the conference semifinals, I would not have said a word. My own, I'm not Reggie Miller and, and Charles Barkley, who had a problem with him leaving OKC. My lone issue with Kevin Durant is the team he chose, which was the team who beat him after he was up 3-1 on them. That's my oh, issue. Oh. Okay, but what if he goes there, and he's the sole reason why they win. Well, then call me when that happens. That's my response. Cool. Call, but let me ask you this question. How could that possibly right. happen when you have a two-time reigning league MVP along it with a part? Let, let, let me ask you a question. Let me answer your question. How can that be when you have a two-time reigning league MVP as the point guard and you have the combination of him and his backcourt mate universally recognized as the greatest shooting backcourt in NBA history. How could it possibly happen that Kevin Durant could do this without them? How is that possible? I'm not saying that he couldn't do it without them, but I mean if he's the sole driving force. I'm saying how could that happen? How could that happen? I mean, what, I mean, it, poss- it could possibly happen. I mean, where were how? They? I mean, Clay Thompson disappeared in last year's finals and stuff. Until game six, I mean, where was he? You know, so, I, I, I mean, it, it's, it could possibly happen. That they could disappear. Let's not act like Clay has a super handle and that he can't disappear in games. No, We've no, seen no. that. So- Clay, Th- Clay Thompson 
on a bad day will hit 40% of his shots and better than 80% from the free throw line. Steph Curry did not have a great NBA Finals by any stretch of the imagination. And if they had won, he would have been the first two-time league MVP to not, or league MVP period, to not having won a champion uh, 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 MVP in the NBA Finals. Had they won back to back, because Draymond Green would have been the MVP of the NBA Finals this go round. All of that is fair. But it's not like they choked and wet the bed. Kevin Durant sure. is, is one of the top three players in the world. We get that. But what does it say about you that you lose to this team, these same dudes in the conference finals after being up three, one of them and then go and join them? Hey, I mean, it's a new day. Players are doing what they want. That's wanna not what do. I asked you. Who the hell doesn't know it's a new day and players don't do that? Players don't do what they want to do. Who the hell don't know that? Well, I know you say, you say you're old school, so I'm trying to figure I'm say, out. I'm why. saying to you, you asked me why, what's the problem? I told you what my problem with it is. Now, if you don't have a problem with it, that's fine. I hope you're looking forward to enjoying the season. True. Oh, I got to ask you one more thing. Hurry up. Uh, do you think that a player like Kobe, because uh, I'm a big fan, do you think that he suffers because a lot of people don't give him the praise necessary, and especially in my generation. I'm a young dude. Do you think that he suffered from not having social media around during his uh, reign? Because I think I don't think I don't think I don't think Kobe suffers at all. I think everybody universally recognized Kobe as one of the greatest players to have ever played the game. Likeability was an issue with him, which affects him. Shaq going out of town to some degree affects him because instead of the five championships that they have, both of them had admitted they would have won seven or eight had they stayed together. And I do believe that you have people who will you know who will always hold that to some degree against Kobe, but the respect will never dwindle. Like ability will dwindle, but the respect will never dwindle because Kobe Bryant is a five time champion in seven tries. I gotta go, Adrian. Thanks a lot. Triple eight Mad Dog six eight 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 six two three three six four six. By the way, <clears throat> here with another note from a Candlewood Sweets Hotel guest. Dana from Room 406 wrote, Hey guys, thanks for lending me the crock pot. I used it to make my favorite chili. End quote. You're welcome, Dana. Make sure you bring some down next time, okay? Even with a full kitchen, you're not expected to pack a blender, toaster oven, or, well, a crock pot. That's why Candlewood Sweets has everything from small kitchen appliances to board games for you to borrow anytime. If you're ready for all the basics you'd expect, plus a genuine staff always willing to help, book your next stay with Candlewood Sweets. Find out more at CandlewoodSweets.com. Candlewood Sweets. True genuine people more with the Stephen a smith show in a minute on mad dog sports radio sirius xm channel 82 three six four six for those of you who missed my take on tony dungy um and my question if he were white would he be a hall of famer you can see what i had to say earlier right here on this show sirius xm mad dog sports radio the Stephen a smith show you can see it on my facebook page Stephen a uh, facebook.com slash Stephen a go check it out it'll be there all day long Go to, go look at it. Twizzy in California. You're live with Stephen A. And Matt. What's up, Twizzy? How you doing, man? Hey, what's going on, Stephen A.? How talk, you doing? Talk to me, bro. Hey, man. I, before I get to my two points real fast, man, I'm so uh, thrilled and excited that Andre Ward got past that uh, matchup this weekend. And was Why, were you that, worried? So. Oh, no, 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 no. I wasn't worried at all. He dominated, he dominated him. I'd rather see Ward fighting Triple G, but I understand that Kovalev is first. I think Andre Ward could win that by decision, but Kovalev is the real deal, and he's a knockout artist, and I must confess to you I'm very, very concerned for Andre Ward in that fight. Ward has a few more tools in the bag, but Kovalev is very, very powerful. Yes, very, very is. powerful. Yes, so, he is. But, um, but, but to my two main points, first, of, uh, you're right. You're spot on about the Tony Dungy. You know what I'm saying? But his biggest accomplishment to me, uh, and, and one of the hardest things to do in sports is to change a culture. And that's what he did in Tampa Bay. He changed the whole entire culture. They were one of the most pitiful and sad franchises in all of sports. You know, and, and he was able to change that. So, you know, I, I, I really uh, think that that was one of his biggest accomplishments. Okay. All right. And then, and then to my second point about the, about the NBA and, you know, you're spot on with your Kevin Durant take and him being, his move being pretty weak. And please stop it. If people that don't understand what you're saying, clearly they don't have a competitive bone in their body if they don't get it. But to super teams, you know, there's, and people always say there always have been super teams, and they're true. That's true, but there's two caveats to that that I haven't heard anybody bring up. One being that 
when they are super teams, there's always been another team that has been just as equally talented to compete with them. You know, Boston, 76ers, Lakers, you know, all those teams were around at the same time and were able to compete with each other, and you never knew which one was going to actually win. That That's what's different, one. And two, the other thing that's so different is that there are there were less teams back then. They didn't have the Charlotte. They didn't have a Charlotte franchise. There wasn't the Miami Heat, uh, the the Toronto, and uh, the Grizzlies. Those franchises weren't around back then, so the talent didn't have to be spread as thin. And I've yet to hear anybody bring those points up when talking about super teams and the competitiveness of the NBA. Got it. Appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Jr. Mississippi, you're live with Stephen A. Amanda. What's up, Jr. How you doing? I'm doing very well, Steve. How are you? I'm good. Talk to me. Okay, I got two things. Uh, guys, uh, I was a Durant fan. I'm still is, but uh, I didn't like him by his him leaving. I have uh, Durant paraphernalia. And uh, guys like, uh, you know, Steve Kirk, you know, they walk into the field, him, this John Cruz and all this. And, you know, I understand, you know, they win championships behind. Uh, you know, I didn't like the way, well, for instance, I didn't like the way they did Mark Jackson with uh, stuff. Steve Kerr didn't have anything to do with that. Well, listen, he did a hell of a job coaching the team once he had it. There's something to be said for not messing up a good thing, and Steve Kerr didn't yeah. do that. So you got to give credit where credit is due. No doubt, no doubt. And uh, I got another issue. Uh, Stephen A., can you come on sometime and speak about uh, the guy in the NFL Hall of Fame that's not in there like uh, a main man, Rob Brazil. I'll always be preaching his name until yeah. someone you know, eventually. Know. As time progresses, we definitely could do that. I appreciate the call, though, man. Thank you so much. Tom in South Carolina, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me, Tom. Yes, yeah, Stephen. My perspective on Tony Dungeon, and this is a 58-year-old white guy who's lived in South Carolina for four years, the impact he has had, uh, it, it shouldn't be forgotten, the impact he has had on white America, because quite honestly, I think there are a lot of white Americans who take a look at Tony Dungeon and say, you know, I never thought I'd say this, but that's the kind of man – I'd want coaching my son in football, or maybe even more important, that's the kind of man I hope my daughter marries one day. I think there are a lot of people who, you know, who would have never thought they would say that about an African American. People like Tony Dungy are changing the way they are perceived, and to me, that is his his great legacy. More so, in, in my mind, being a white man than what he has done for the African American community. Well, I can understand that you're you're coming from a different perspective, and you're entitled to that. I can't disagree with you. Um, I'm not white, just like you're not black. So it, right. Tony Dungy affects you in one way; he affects me uh, in another. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, when you consider the profound impact he's had, you got to right. give credit as credit is due, and just and just and and just love it from that perspective and respect. Yes, it. sir. I definitely yeah. understand where can you're I, coming from, Tom. Can I say this about A. Rod real quick? Sure. I, you know, I've always been. To me, I've never liked him. My my model is Cal Ripken. I'm a Baltimore guy, and he never compared. But, I, you know, as old as I am now, I realize if I could go back about my profession, the way I've lived my life, there's things I regret, and I wish I could go back and change. When I heard A-Rod's press conference, if he wasn't being honest, he fooled me, and I was willing to give him the benefit of the doubt about me being at a point in his life where he realizes, you know, I really screwed up. I wish I could go back and do something about it. You, now, you seem to be thinking – that that's not part of who he is yet. But for his sake, I, I, I just hope that he has gotten to a point in his life where he truly has gotten to a point where he understands I've made some mistakes, I wish I could go back and have lived my life differently. And if he's done that, I think we have to give him credit for that. Well, we got to give him credit for it, but at the same time is that he makes such a, he puts forth such a strenuous effort in, in spinning his image in a certain direction. He almost seems so phony with it. Um, and, right. and, and when you look at it from that perspective, uh, to have that press conference yesterday, he just looked phony. He just looked yeah. phony and it reminded you of how fake he was in, 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 in elevating his image to begin with. That's the bad part yeah. in all of this. Yeah, but the older you get, the more I think you look back in life and say, darn, I wish I could have done it differently in some ways. I got you. I appreciate okay, the call, buddy. You. Thank you. Triple A Mad Dog 6 is always the number to call. It's 888-623-3646. Your phone call to close out the show in a minute with Stephen A. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. We don't have a commercial break. That's even better for me. Got distracted by the news, by the way. I don't know if y'all seen the news. You remember how um, Jeb Bush was against Donald Trump? 
You know, he was called the hypocrite, a lightweight, desperate and sad, weak, no chance, enlisted his mommy as his brother. Jeb failed as Jeb, not a leader, low energy, clueless politician. These are all the things that Donald Trump said about him. Jeb Bush couldn't endorse him, obviously. But his son backs Donald Trump. Wow, politics, boy. Stuff gets interesting. I'll tell you, I can't wait for the debates. To me, Hillary against uh, Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump in those debates, it's must-see television. I just can't wait. I just can't wait. Let's go to Chris and Philly. You're live with Stephen Amado. What's up, Chris? How are you? Hey, Phil. Uh, I'm good. How are you, Stephen? I'm great. Thank you for calling. What's up? Hey, I, I wanted to talk real quick about Kevin Durant. And, and first and foremost, let me say I'm of the old school mentality where you beat the guy who beat you. You you want to compete, that competitive nature, okay? Mm-hmm. Now that I got that out there, though, what I think you're failing to realize, or, or I'm sure some of this you do, Kevin Durant lost up 3-1 to one to Golden State. Golden State lost to LeBron's super team. What bit of logic would make you think that if he came back next year with the same squad, that he would beat LeBron? So if you can't beat them, LeBron almost set the footprint of joining these super teams. Like, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. LeBron did not join a team that beat him. No, 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 no. LeBron, uh, uh, no, you heard that wrong, or I said it wrong. He formulated a super team. He went to go build one with Bosch and Wade. He went to go get one. And I know there was super teams before, but they were more built organic, right? Pippen was always there, and then Jordan was there. Yes, they brought in Rodman. Right, the Celtics were form, formed there. They were all drafted there, or young players. So when LeBron goes and builds this team of superstars in their prime, he set the precedent of what needs to be done. When you're going to build these teams, even like he did in Cleveland, you have to build your team. You have to go and, and, and build a team that can compete with the precedent that LeBron set. I think that's what you're failing to acknowledge. That's why KD did it. it it's well, not that I'm, he's not competitive. I, I, I'm failing to acknowledge it because... They beat him. That's my issue. Okay. Either, you're changing the narrative. Everybody's acting like, listen, if, if Kevin Durant joined San Antonio, would not, would that not be a super team? Well, yes, it would well, be. Well, well, well let me finish. Let me finish. I wouldn't mind it at all. You know why? Because he beat them. My issue is that he beat them. It's not what Barkley and Reggie Miller said about him leaving OKC. It's the fact right. that he went to the team that knocked him off. That's okay. my only okay. issue. Nothing else. So, with all due respect, you just acknowledge that he lost. The team that beat him. So clearly Golden State was a better team. A team still not good enough to beat Cleveland. This because year that's goal. not my point. My point is everybody when I just told you I said anyone but the team that beat you you're not changing my mind on that I'm only saying not I'm not debating anything with anybody it's not a debate to me my issue is I have a problem with any player who goes to the team that beat them that's it Nothing else. It's the best opportunity for him to win. Okay, that's fine. And and, and that's fine. I'm not even disputing that. I have a problem with any player. To me, that's LeBron going to Boston. It's, it's, It's Jordan going to Detroit. It's Isaiah going to Boston. That It's Ewing going to Chicago or Reggie Miller. It's all of that to me. It's it's anybody that goes to the team that beat you, I have a problem with it. And, and I respect that, Stephen A. But that's all. That's not the lead. But that's not the but, 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 lead. Wait, wait a minute. But that's it. That That's what I think, Chris. I, I, of course LeBron, uh, KD, of course Durant is not wrong for doing what he thought was best. Of course they that, that, that he went to the team that beat him and it approves that you. I get all of that. I'm not refuting what you're saying. I'm saying I don't like any player who goes to the team that beats him. That's it. That's all. I don't want to monopolize time. I got one quick question for you, and I don't care if I hear it off air. What was the purpose of uh, the Lakers bringing in Luol Deng when you just had a high draft pick? From I have no clue. No squad? I have no clue. And giving him $72 million, don't get me started with that, Chris. Don't get me started. All right. Don't get me started. I appreciate it, Steven. Thanks a lot. Sam and Union Deal, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, Sam? Stephen A., what's going on, man? I'm good. Go ahead. What? What's? What's? I have a problem with the with LeBron getting killed for the super team thing. 
Because my whole thing is, yeah, the way they went about it, Wade and LeBron, they joined teams, you know, a way it was never done. But let's not act like Dr. J's 76ers team, then all the famers. Let's not act like like uh, like uh, Magic Johnson didn't have all the famous. Like I hate that this guy is always killed for it. And I'm like, you who, know, who LeBron? Who play. LeBron? Yeah, they want to kill LeBron. Oh, LeBron had to join Wade and join a super team. And I'm like, come on now. Well, they weren't super. I mean, until, not... They weren't super until he arrived. Exactly. Kevin that's Durant true, can't say the like... same. Kevin Durant cannot say the same. Stephen, a., can I ask you a question real Go quick? Ahead, real quick. Every they have no center. What are they going to do with that? Not even a, a legit. They don't have interior presence. I think that's going to be a big problem for Golden State. What do you think? Well, it could be a problem, but are you assuming that Andrew Bogut was a real center? But he defensively, under- defensively, and rebounding. Yes, offensively, you're assuming that he was a good that he was um, a real center. No, nah, he, he wasn't. But I don't think they utilized them either. They didn't utilize Andrew Bogut. Is that what you just said? No, I think no. I, I, did you see? I, I was I was just saying because I saw that Olympic I gotta go. I gotta go. Day. Answer the question. Do you think? Are you saying no, they didn't utilize no, Andrew no, Bogut? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Have a nice day, Sam. They didn't in, in, utilize Andrew Bogut. <laughs> Please, Eli in Indiana, real quick. You live with Stephen A. What's up? Hey, hey, Stephen A. Um, so my question is, who do you think has the best shot of knocking off the Cavs in the Eastern Conference this year? With the uh, best, the, the, the team with the best shot would be the Boston Celtics with the acquisition of Al Horford, but I don't think they'll do it either. Thanks a lot. Let's go to Angelo in Philadelphia. You're live with Stephen A. Real quick, Angelo, what's up? Not much, Stephen A. Hurry up! Well, you only got you only got a few seconds. Go! Hurry up! Well, I gotta disagree with you. I'm a Warrior fan, and the way that everybody's acting, I don't think that they would have done too many things different. And when you think about Hold it, stop right there. Stop right there. If they were who? The Warriors? Yeah. Nobody would have done anything sure. different. I would have taken Kevin Durant if I were the Warriors. The issue is not with the Warriors at all. The issue is with Kevin Durant choosing to go to the team who beat him. But, but like I'm saying, I don't think the people that are saying this stuff would have chose many other places other than the Warriors. And mm. me personally, you know, I would have to say if I'm going to play ball, I want to. Play- I'll tell you this much. I got to go. But I'll tell you this. If it were me. And you're saying that I wouldn't have done something if Miami would have kept Kevin Durant and Chris Bosh was coming back healthy. I would have went to Miami. Tell you that right now.